partners, uh, with various protection resources, and it was just a complex operation. So those are all things that kind of make the search forester um, want to uh, either have a ring plan or um, or have just extra communication. And yeah. Okay. So taking taking those things as well as our goals um, for efficiency. Uh, that um, we're coming to draft that rule language. Um, and like I said, it's just a draft. So once again, it's an administrative change only. We've been asked to try to write the rule in the positive. So try to say when written plans are required rather than when they're not required. I'm not sure how it's going to come out, but um, taking that into account. Um, of course, create certainty. Uh, this, is, this is kind of a weird one, but allow for sewage or forester discretion. That was a large one, because sewage or foresters, and we do want to give them, they have knowledge of what's happening on the ground. They know their operators, they know their landowners. Um, um, trying to allow that discretion, however, is the, the opposite of certainty. However, um, we're just going to try to work through it and see what we can come up with. Um, but. So incorporate that slope criteria somehow. Um, there's been some ideas to keep the standards all in rule or write um, a technical note or a guidance document along with it. And basically just try to keep it simple. Um, we want this to be, uh, the administrative process to be kept clean and have no real hang-ups and hopefully it will, um, it will go through. So that I think is it. And those are my questions. Um, so we can we can do lunch now if you'd like. And I'll see if that was pretty quick in the, in the talking, so. How do, we, how do we feel? Do you want to do questions, or we can grab lunch? Um, does anybody have any questions? Well, we can come back to questions. We're not, it, yeah. we're not, we're just taking a pause to stretch and eat. And while we're eating, we can grill Ashley and make her late for lunch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> chew on this way, chew on that. Yeah. Twenty-one sixty-five. This written notification. So, you had a question. I have a specific question. I I feel like I'm really missing something, so I feel stupid asking this. Question. So, so I'm let's see. At, well, I don't know what number of slide it is. But it's the slide before Paul's wonderful cartoon. Is mm -hmm. there slide for that? Mm -hmm. um, it, it starts at top for twenty-one sixty-five letters. It's on our page six. It says, operation, statutory work, written plan, yes. operations within 100 feet may have requirement for written plans waived if one of the following criteria are met. And one of those is that there's a general vegetation retention description, right? So if it has that, the written plan may be waived. Right. But then on slide, this is where I feel so yeah, No, no. <laughs> then on slide, uh, page, I think I lost it. Page, uh, page, page 11, general vegetation attention to city recession. It's recommended to still require. Right, okay. Oh, all right. So here's the thing is that we went to the legislature and said <coughs> we have these, you know, what we think are uh, non value added written plans that are wasting resources. And so we thought we knew the categories. And so one, and, you know, Brad Knotts and I wrote the legislation, and one of the categories that had come up in initial discussions were the, all they're doing is following the general vegetation prescriptions. And so those are written in rule. Why are we making a rewrite to the, rule, the rules to say that we're following the vegetation prescription? So we had that as an option. So the board could tell us, yeah, go ahead and waive those plans. Um, so as we went out to stakeholders, though, uh, and so for instance, um, the other one that we could waive is we could waive uh, aerial applications of written plans for aerial applications that are for small fish bearing streams, you know, because they, they're not in the riparian area. So we had a broad definition. They're not going to affect the riparian area. They're going to use a standard prescription and they're going to, or they're under a stewardship agreement. When we went out and talked to stakeholders about that first choice, standard vegetation description, 
We heard it from both our stewardship foresters and the uh, Regional Forest Practices Committee, which are landowner representatives and public members, that those written plans add value. They're not just repeating what's in the rule, but they're actually going out there and saying, I checked the basal area, the basal area is uh, 200, and 200 square feet. I'm going to remove, take it down to 150 square feet. I'm going to remove trees in these size classes. It'll leave, and then they'll have what's left. And then that we can check what's going to be left against the rules about what needs to be left. And so it turns out, while we thought maybe this would be a good category of written plans to waive, the feedback we've gotten from our uh, stewardship foresters in the land on the community is don't waive those. Essentially, if they're going to be operating in the riparian area, require them to have a written plan. So that was a, the one sort of category where you were operating within a riparian area where we were going to waive a written plan. Now the other one that, you know, this one that's still up in the air has to do with the cable logging, where they're not really, they're, it's, are they really operating in the riparian area? Well, yes, in the sense that they have to string cables and do things like that. We're still exploring that, as Ashley said. Is there a subset of those that tend to be boilerplate that really aren't necessary, that we can achieve that same communication in another way. And I think Ashley has some more to narrow that down. So just to rephrase what I think you said, so I understand it. The House bill did allow for a waiver. However, you are recommending in rulemaking that for a general prescription plan that it not be waived. Yeah, and the House bill allows the Board of Forestry to decide whether or not to weigh. And so what Ashley's working on and what this input is, is she's going to go to the Board of Forestry and say, you have an authority to let the state forester waive written plans. We're going to recommend that you give us the authority to waive it. We know for sure we're going to give it for the authority where there's no operation within the riparian area. And then there'll be a set of cases where we're still going to require a written plan, and we, it, the way it looks now, and it's still in process, that if you're operating in the written plan, even if you're using the standard prescription, a written plan is still required. Okay. Um, so, and so, it's, and, and that's just probably maybe the layout of my, my slides, but just, just you know, the, if it says discussion above it, it was just that's just in in talking what's been said. So. Um, that when, when, you, when you get to the slides, there are mm -hmm. concepts and discussion. Yeah. We support that. <laughs> <laughs> we support the part of the And so looking at the questions up here, you know, just to get thoughts going, what are the pieces of written plans that you value? What, you know, we already kind of clarified that you value written plans around pressurized herbicide applications as being valuable. Um, the That's the wrong kind of there. Pardon? <laughs> the wrong kind of there. Don't, don't yeah. um, That's right. That's yeah. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> there. Um, are there intended consequences? All right. So I, I have a question. I don't know if it falls underneath this and she don't mind if it's hang up, but so, um, thinking forward to the notification being online, the written plan will also be online, correct? Yeah, yes. Okay, and then, so, so if an operation gets its written plan waived because of a certain prescription or agreement, can we then have a link or whatever be able to see, see that agreement or that prescription? The stewardship agreement. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if it's, if, if, I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah. 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 If, they're, if we're waiving the written plans because they're not operating in the riparian area at all, right. under that rule, there will be no written plan. Right. And there's no 
documentation other than they're not going to operate in refinery. Hopefully, there will be some documentation saying that they checked on that. Well, I'm hoping. <laughs> well yeah, and we, we then, prioritize yeah. which operations we so, check. So the stewardship agreement has a public well, review process. Let me talk about that, but first. Yeah. Documentation saying they checked on that would be what we call an inspection right. report. Yeah. Okay, and that's and that's the uh, that's the the uh, uh, currency of information about our guy visiting the place right. to determine compliance. Will that be available? Those those are available now. Okay. They're not part of the subscription process. Right. Okay. I mean, if you if you uh, they're available in so far as they're public records. Right. Well, I mean, no, but but but, but, now that we're getting in. but so the business. I'm but getting the, you more. <laughs> we're getting into Joe's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm to let me. Let me. Real quickly on the the stewardship agreement is a public document. Right. And there's a public review process for that. And, so. And for the stewardship agreements that we currently have, those people that were subscribers for the areas that were considered under the agreement received copies of it and were invited. To Okay. So the subscription process, if somebody proposes a stewardship agreement in the area to which you currently subscribe, you'll get a copy of the draft stewardship agreement, just like you do a written plan. Okay. Stewardship oh, that's agreement. not required by statute. That's well, just we, just did it. we just did yeah. it that way. And yeah. Stewardship agreements is a whole other big deal, but um, there's a tw for stewardship agreements, there's a 21-day public comment period, and we publish them in newspapers. And uh, and the examples of Dave, talk to Dave Eisler, is the guy. Just go see Dave and ask him how it shook out for him. Right. Or John Sundstrom, you know Johnny Sundstrom, right. he's got one. And get, get, ask him to expound on that, and he will tell you all about it. And um, stewardship agreements are they're a tool that we're able to use, and and it, and for some landowners. It might be a thing that could really save us time and save them time too, although they don't realize it yet. But the, our recent example in right stewardship agreements that was able to occur because there was some federal funding with regard to spotted owl habitat enabled us to work through the mechanics of figuring out how to do it and hopefully we'll be able to apply that to create some efficiencies later on. With respect to your question about the inspection reports, there's not, you know, the, the statute and rule require that, that subscribers get copies of written plans, and the statute and rule do not say anything about inspection reports. Right. Okay. And so uh, an online notification system or an online transfer of, of written plans, it, there's no requirement now to include correspondence between the state forester and the landowner or timber owner or uh, operator. Right. Although that information is available because it's public records, but the whole statute. You have to know to ask for it. Right. I mean, you could, you, you know, you could come in and say, I want, you know, if you had a real interest, you could come in and say, I want to see your, your copies of your correspondence with regard to this notification, and it's like asking for any other public information. But the thing about written plans and notifications is statute describes their responsibilities to subscribers. Right. So back again, questions on House Bill Twenty One Sixty Five. What you know, and if. You don't have questions, then what's your level of concern about where or comfort with the work, the process is ongoing, you know, the direction we're taking with it, and then the, a follow-up question is we have, uh, as we get to the rule analysis, are you interested in coming back to look at the rule language and follow up? Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Please. <laughs> okay. This would be a good time to um, Yeah, I yeah. think so. Um, we had, <clears throat> when you wrote an email to us, Peter, about part of this discussion would be discussing the value, the value added plans. Um, we have a set of bullet points which we will turn in you know, about the value. And also, Tom Kearns couldn't be here today and wrote a short statement that Michelle could read. So maybe you should read that first quick, just short, and then I can. Dr. Tom Kearns is also a board member of Beyond Toxics. He's also the director of Environment and Human Rights Advisory. 
The Oregon Department of Forestry has a moral obligation to Oregon citizens and stakeholders to require they provide timely and functionally useful prior notification of forestry pesticide applications, meaning this obligation is a moral minimum, not a lofty aspiration. It is a duty of justice, not a duty of virtue. Failure to require timely prior notifications, especially given the readily available capabilities and immediacy of today's online digital technologies, would represent a moral lapse and an abridgment of the right to know, a long recognized and broadly endorsed ethical mandate promulgated by the EPA. Um, that's the... Uh, Environmental Protection Association. Right, right, right. I'm just noting this. When he says notification, it should say slash written plan. Yeah, that's fine. a good idea. And outlined in several human rights documents. He's just got notes down there. No. Respecting citizens' right to know is necessary because it supports the most basic right to life, liberty, and security of person outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 3, and in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 9. The latter signed and ratified by the U.S., giving it the force of domestic law. Many citizens require prior notification of pesticide application, perhaps because they or family members are pesticide sensitive, or immunocompromised, or elderly, or very young, or pregnant, or are facing other health challenges, so they can take measures to protect their own and the family's health, protect the health of the pets and farm animals, and or protect sensitive vegetation, water resources from being accidentally contaminated by pesticide drift and runoff. Online databases, push notifications, and automatic emailings could go a long way for meeting these requirements. If ODF failed to meet this obligation, it could leave citizens with the impression that ODF and forest industries are trying to game the notification system in such a way as to actually prevent citizens from receiving the timely prior notifications due them. This isn't an indictment. He is actually suggesting that this could occur. The potential consequences of an agency ignoring human rights norms are not small, even from the perspective of the agency, and even when viewed through the lens of basic practicality. When human rights standards are compromised and institutional trust is lost, the consequences can be monumental, costly, costly and long-lasting. Providing timely, detailed, and usable notifications will thus benefit the agency. It will certainly benefit citizens, and it will also benefit the public perception of timber companies as concerned good neighbors. Who should I give this to? Because we'd like to Peter. Sure. Okay, can you spell his last name? K E R A S. Um, and it, you know, if Tom would uh, like to send this out electronically, that would be useful as well. You can keep it with the file and possibly from the one sixty five. Okay, and then you had bullet points. Yes, uh, addressing the question of value added. So um, you said one value is that people need written plans to help protect their own water resources and health. Second value is uh, that people can participate in decision making, meaning they can submit a comment. Uh, so it can value democracy. Um, third is a written plan helps identify the resource and the steps being taken to protect it. <clears throat> And now this is a statement, and actually I have a question, because the language in Ashley's presentation said it was a social contract? Social license to Social license law. To We thought that a written plan or legal binding contracts between the state and the person or operator filing the written plan to protect water resources. No, the, it's not, no, the written plan was not approved. Um, the de you can't. Well, the only one that could actually change the actual uh, a adherence to the forest practice rules is called a plan for alternate practice. So, if you're not going to do what's specified in rule, but you think you can have a better outcome on the resources, you can do a plan for alternate practices. And the case that's most frequently used are uh, like on big wind storms. There's a standard alternate practices about how you treat riparian areas and uh, disaster. I think, I think what we meant is that 
when, a, when someone right. a, a written plan, is, does it constitute a contract? It does not. No. What it, what it, what it really is is a is a, uh, a more discreet notification. Or imagine it turns up the turns up the turns up the resolution on the notification process for that portion of the operation. Right. Yeah. And so, so uh, I, I guess I'm going to give an example of this. if the required basal area of the weeding was 100 square feet of the basal area and the written plan said I'm going to leave 120 square feet of basal area, if there was no, you know, and then they went in there and they ended up leaving 115, we would not find them in violation of their written plan. There's not that sort of thing. They would have still exceeded the Forest Practice Act mm -hmm. and so that would be considered a fine yeah. outcome. Another another place the uh, approval process, a really common approval for an alternate practice is when people want to take forest land and apply some other land use, and that's when they get a pony, or they want to have a, mm -hmm. uh, a, a wedding business or something that requires to take the places where the trees grew and take them out of that use, and that's and and that's and we're and we authorize that only after the Lane County uh, Planning Office tells us that it's consistent with zoning requirements. Okay. And uh, so we approve that. Okay. And that's an, we approve an exemption from the reforestation rules. So we, we, actually, we approve an exemption from a requirement. Okay. So when we turn this into it, it says work plans provide binding contracts. You understand that? Yeah. Didn't understand. That, yeah. Okay. Uh, helps protect fish, and in our voice, in our words, it says, "Gives fish a voice where they would not have one." I mean, by following, filing a written plan, you're acknowledging the riparian zone, the F condition of the stream, and you're helping protect fish where they can't speak for themselves. Uh, another value is it allows the state forester to provide comments to improve resource protection and compliance with the Clean Water Act. Another value is it gives a chance to correct human error. You mentioned sometimes people just make mistakes. And uh, lastly, the value is it protects everyone from potential timber theft and illegal behavior. So those are the values. And you do have those written down. Yeah, I'll turn this in. Uh, I can turn the one into now. It also has our ideas on notification, so we'll get to that. Yeah, so I don't know if it's a help here. Yeah, if you'll help And me. I would say, uh, as a subscriber, the one of the main values of uh, getting a notification is it gives me the phone number of the operator <laughs> to call. I have I, somebody I can ask questions of. But the, the notification. Yeah. No, that's what she's saying. That's one of the values of the note. Yeah. 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 And uh, and that will still be available. Um, so I, I don't disagree with any of these kind of comments. And I'll ask Ashley is you know in terms of what they see as value added, has that been consistent with where we're seeing people say yes, wave plans, and no, don't wave plans? So I mean, as far as all of these things that you've stated, um, resource protection. Um, allowing that social part those are all those are all um, things that our internal staff and um, our, our stakeholders through the regional force practice committee they recognize that and they recognize that there's that important piece and we don't want to leave anything out we just want to highlight that I think some of these things um, they realize can be recognized from the notification um, you know such as the, the stream size and you know that's something that is I research when I when I research the notification. I have to document what stream it is and, and um, the class of it. So there's that communication that's happening through the notification that way. Um, and I mean, I think it's I think you are in line, and we'll we'll take these comments and we'll try to make sure that nothing's left out when we go. And I'm happy that you guys are wanting to participate further into the case too and the draft for the draft rule. So that would be good. I guess my question is how how would not having the written plans or <clears throat> moving towards this more streamlined uh, procedure 
leave some of our concerns out. Because you're saying, well, we can, we'll still address your concerns in, in other ways, mm -hmm. but what, what's going to be left out by getting well, this Well, and here's the thing, so you were interested in protecting fish and technology and identifying the resources and um, level of protection. Uh, you know, if the stream is a fish or a non-fish or a small, medium, large, it's going to be identified regardless of whether there's a written plan or not. And then, the, in terms of resource protection, where we're headed with these changes now, if there's going to be any activity within the riparian area, the area deserving protection, there will be a written plan. You know, right now, the only one that we're, we're really comfortable saying that everybody's agreed with is if you're not operating with a, within the riparian area, you're within 100 feet, but you're not in the riparian area. That's the only thing that I would say right now we have kind of 100% agreement, uh, albeit the slope issue may complicate that. Um, yeah, so that. if there's some reason there's some value in that, that outside portion is just out the, outside the army, if you're it, finding some value in that, that is what potentially, I guess, you know, we could be losing. And, uh -huh. it, and we're still going to explore the steep slope make that override the fact that you're not in it. And we don't know the answer to that. We've heard there's concern with steep slope. And the definition, which has been brought up, is trying to figure out maybe we need to create some type of definition for that. So that was the yeah. So yeah. Did we, but before we go on, did I kind of get at your question? I, I think that if, if um, there was a resource protection issue, um, the if there was any sort of concern that the operation was going to affect a, repair, affect a riparian resource, we would not be waiving the written plan. The way it's specified is that there can't, we're only waiving written plan when there's no impact to the riparian area. And, and I, correct me if I, currently someone can turn in a, a notification and demonstrate that there's no, no, uh, no protected resources for which a written plan is required. And once the subscribers, if there are any, have been considered, we may waive the balance of the 15-day waiting period. That's how we do business now. And correct me if I'm wrong, this process is still going to require a waiver, is it not? Or is it a, it's, it's an area for which it's not required? It's not a waiver, it's not part of this. This is just going to be not required. Yeah, yeah, if we can, otherwise we say we have to do, we have to process waivers. Yeah. We've just replaced one yeah. type of yeah. seed activity yeah. with another. Yeah. So, and that would, you know, yeah. lead to potential people just but, turning in their plans just in case. But, yeah. and then, but, but written plans may be required yeah. under certain circumstances that haven't been articulated yet with regard to slope, right? Well, we, we yeah, but well, aerial we, application herbicides. We know that Our written. Requirement. We know there's some that we're not going to. We're pretty confident we're not going to require a written plan. Some that we're confident that we are going to re require a written plan. There's still some gray area there associated with slope that we need to clarify. We'll come back and in the second meeting. And that's when and we the, can start to create either a, a guidance document or a technical note or something like that that will clearly spell out those type of operations. And, and, and I don't know if you guys know it or not, this is just statutorily required written plans. We can still ask for written plans for other things already that aren't statutorily required. The other thing to think about is this isn't if, you know, the, this is an administrative rule change, which means it doesn't have to go through 714 analysis. It's in, in a lot of ways, it's a technical change. I say that because it's a fairly easy one to do. So the, what the approach we're taking is we're only going to do the things we're sure about this time and see what we learn. And it can go either way. We're still finding we're getting a lot of plans that aren't value added. Then we might come back and ask for further ability to weigh for another class as we do this process. What, uh, conversely, if we're finding all of a sudden we're getting a lot of resource damage and we mistook what was a value-added written plan, we can um, quit yeah. waving them up front. Okay, I have one, another yeah. question. If, if money wasn't a concern, this is a budget, you're doing this because of budget, 
That's what I'm primarily hearing. If you had all the money and all the staff, would you use this as an extra added step of caution? Or would you want to get rid of this anyway? I would want to get rid of it anyway. And that's because regardless of the level of resources I have, it's where I allocate those resources. And, and currently I'm not doing pre-op, we're not doing pre-op inspections on all operations. We're having to prioritize those operations which are higher risk of resource damage and trying to get to all of those. So I just don't believe in terms of state government that we should be doing anything that doesn't add value. And so if we have discovered over time that the written plan, if it's not adding any value, we shouldn't be doing it regardless of the resources because, uh, you know, wasting resources is not a sustainable way to be, even at, you know, at our level. If we're yeah. using resources to take this, it's not good business. So. The higher value here is to have your stewardship foresters out on the ground working with the landowners to know there's operators who are harvesting, spending their time there rather than in the office mm -hmm. of the shop here. So it was triggered by uh, budgetary <coughs> constraints, mm -hmm. and but I think that you, we're going to, this won't be the first process we may be involved in looking at ways we can streamline how we do things to see if there are other non-value added activities that we're doing and we would try to eliminate those steps. If they're not adding value, we shouldn't be doing them. And so... Should we move on to the next question? Yes, please. Sure. That's running out of time. So, yeah. So, um, we'll be in contact. This is just a quick... We're going to do our phase two. Um, have heard some draft rolling. Let's hopefully we can be part of it. And then phase three, phase four. So, we can keep all this and see how we're going to work.
I kind of equate this whole whole process to everyone saying just make just do what you do now and make it, take it online. And I always equate that to I may have a 75 Pinto that barely runs, and if I put new tires on it to make it go faster, it's still a 75 Pinto that doesn't barely runs, right? So we've got to improve the process that we do today before we take that and be honest. So otherwise, you're just making something that isn't working, doing it poorly, faster. So uh, one thing that uh, there's no point in speeding up a bad process. There's no way guidance says it. Yeah. So uh, to give a little bit of history. I was originally brought on, and I developed the uh, helped develop the current fax system, which is uh, now a statewide shared database, uh, a much better system than was there before. The system there. Before or just to let you know how old it was, it was designed when Ronald Reagan was in office and launched when Bush won was president. So uh, that's how old that system was, and we were just barely keeping it air together with phone out of data from there, really. And the person, the one person in the entire state that knew how to run it and maintain it was retiring. So I was brought in to help design the new system and launch it. I have a copy of the old database starting in 19. So we know where to send people historically, because I don't think we have that. that, that, that. And so that's uh, that's good to know, because after seven years, we're required to eliminate records. So, um, which is a legal requirement. So I'll I'll review quickly overview budget two, kind of what the results are, and then we'll get into the meat of why we're here today. Okay. Uh, so budget note two came out of the 2011 legislature. Uh, it was something we had to go out and contract with a third party expert on helping us redo, redo our processes. Uh, um, guide on solution um, is who came in. They helped us. They had several sessions uh, between uh, stewardship foresters, unit managers, office specialists, and IT come in and help us kind of look at our processes, what goes well, what does not do well, and uh, determine areas where we need an improvement. There was there were actually, as Peter said, 27 areas that were identified and we prioritized those. And the first two that we identified were the notification processing and then inspections, getting that feedback into the system again. Um, Can we see a whole list of the 27? I don't know if I have. Okay. But we can send you. Yeah. If can you, you take that? If you, uh, maybe I will uh, circulate a piece of paper. If you put your name and email address down, um, you can send them the uh, budget note to report. To right. And it has the twenty-seven. Uh, again, the high priorities were the notification and inspections. We took the new process and launched it into uh, six different offices total. Phase one started in February, and that was in a Hughes office, the Fenton Falls in Dallas. We went to three different areas that the Department of Forestry has, and we decided to pick an office in each one. It was so successful, about two-thirds of the way through that, we launched it in uh, Roseburg, Grants Pass, and Medford, because the travel on me is a lot easier to go down to five than to three different areas. And no matter what office we put it in, whether it was a low volume office or a high volume office, that were, uh, it was very successful. Very efficiency scheme. Uh, there is uh, also what's, what we wanted to <coughs> point out is between 2011 and 2012, there was a significant increase in the number of notifications. So we weren't dealing with the same number of notifications in CDP. We were looking at an increase in volume and still seeing gains. So that was that was pretty significant. So uh, over the time period that we were looking at in the two different offices, in 2011 there were 800 notifications, and then in 2012 there were over 1,048. And in that same time, we processed the notifications faster. So we went from an average of 3.4 days down to 2.4 days. So there was a whole a day a gain a day gained in that processing time we, when we received it and when it was actually posted and then mailed out. So that that increases our communication. Uh, so as in addition to that, 
there was a four time increase in the number of inspections that were put into the system. Now there were th really three reasons for that. One, it was a new process. It made it easier for us to get inspections into the system. Two, there were additional stewardship foresters. We have more foresters, so you're going to get more inspections in there because there's more, a, a little bit less of a workload, so you get out in the field more often. And the bottom line is, we're getting it into the system. A lot of stewardship foresters, or all the stewardship foresters, do inspections. They just don't put it into the system. Now this new process makes it very easy for them to get it into the system, and now we can actually do reporting and, and uh, record the work that's being done rather than having to go and have them manually calculate. And you can see some of the comments. They're spending a day in the field. Uh, that was from Mike Hogan in Coos. He is kind of the lead. He is the lead uh, search enforcer there, which, which almost is uh, a, it's basically a supervisor. So he was doing a lot of that. There's also our IT person there. So he was doing a lot of that type of work and not actually getting out into the field. And it had been quite a few months until he had, since he'd been out there. And with this new process, he actually gained a full day to get out into the field. So that's pretty significant. It went from zero days to one day a week. Um, it's also being noticed by the timber companies that are stewardship foresters are out in the field, where you can see uh, Nick Morris and Coos, and then uh, Jennifer in Dallas, who's basically said it's, it's doubled her time in the field from doing having to do all the, the administrative work herself that she can now hand it off and off to specialists to take care of that. So what we're going to be talking about is the current system, the fax system today, is this is what it looks like on your subscribe screen. And then I, I cut off the address. So there's an address maintenance here, and then there's actually, here's what how we document what your notification looks like. So you're really limited to a township range and section, and you need one of these screens for every section, or di different section or different township. Different. So as you have a large subscription area, you may, some of these uh, subscribers have 20, 30 different one of these screens. That's just how our system works and how the database works. Uh, it's difficult to administer internally. Uh, it's not the easiest process for, for our subscribers either. And there's no electronic option. You receive a paper copy mail to you. There's no way to get it you know, via email or even uh, be able to log into the system. So that obviously needs to change. So in order to change that, we're going to talk about what the new system is going to do. And this is, this is we're talking about what. Right? And it's hard to separate what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. So we're, we're, uh, the basic structure is I want the system to be able to do this as a subscriber. That's my role as a subscriber. I want the system to be able to do this because this is the value add it provides, it provides to me. So the example is, I'm a parent, I need a car that has four doors, so it's easy to get the kids in and out of the back seat. Think of it as that way, that's the example I, I use uh, to kind of explain how we're going to do this. And, but we don't want you to tell us how to build the car. Right. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want, you know, it, it's, it needs to have four doors. So we don't want to say, you know, are we going to get a minivan, are we going to get a, you know, whatever. It's just, it needs to have four doors, it needs to have four tires, it needs to, you know, it needs to have, uh, you know, high safety rating, that kind of stuff. That's the that's how we're going to build the requirements. And I've kind of taken it based on feedback and what the current system is, uh, and built a list of requirements. But we're going to go for each one, and we're going to define it, and we're going to change, and we're going to add, and we're going to probably go with maybe I don't know what the lead, but we'll definitely change. We'll add notes to clarify, and that's what this is all about. This is this is where I need your feedback. Did I miss something in your background? Did you were you a part of this organization before you were in this position? No, no. Okay. I come from the outside. I've been right. with the department for <laughs> yeah, three and, and a half years. Yeah, right. we I've been all here for three years. Yeah, we all come from the outside. <laughs> um, Joe's a Joe's a business analyst, so gotcha. we've been uh, much better at. We used to think foresters could do everything. <laughs> we can, but albeit not as well as professionals in that field. So we used to have, for instance, a forester running our HR department. Not a good idea. So, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, so Joe's background is in from 
information technology you came from? Well, 14 years at Intel, uh, 10 of that was sales and marketing. And then uh, for as, as IT, my degree is in IT, uh, but then I also owned a business down here in Eugene. So uh, that was totally outside. Okay. Big small group. Okay. So that's right. Gotcha. Do I kind of actually in a different stick out like a all the Well, I was picking up on something, but I wanted to document it. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's good or bad. No, it's, it's great. Okay. So this this is what we're going to kind of look at, and then let's just build some user stories. Let's uh, let's hear. Let's review what I have, and then let's go through your list and throw it in there. Now, what we come up with today may not be what it ends up with because as we're looking at this project in a big scope, it's going to be done in what we call iterative. So it's going to be done in small sections. So we're going to get maybe the login part working and then we'll get the submit the notification part working and maybe get the mapping working. And we're building it in small parts. We're not going to do, as uh, when I was at Intel, the first project, the IT project I worked on, it was 14 months by the time I started working on it before we ever saw any result. And it's, we can't do it that way. It needs to be small chunks. And this is how we built the fax system as we got the notification part done. And then we got the subscriber part done. And then we got the inspections part done. And then we got the renewal part done. And um, just based on priority, how, how we develop things. So it's about every eight to 10 weeks we got a chunk in there. This new system probably be every four to six weeks we'll get a new section of functionality. That That's way, uh, it's, the, it's called Agile programming? Correct. It's called and Agile. It allows, we don't wait 14 months and get some big thing that doesn't work. Oh. We get something four to six weeks and we say, yeah, this, this is kind of working, this is right along the line. It allows for a much more adapted development of a system. It also forces the contractor to build something that is uh, componentized so that you know you don't have this huge thing that it's all tied together. So you know, up, it, up here you should be on there. Yeah. Absolutely. So within that within that process when you're building these things, it's you're meeting every single day to talk about what are we doing, what what's the next part, what's, what's the next step. And then at about the, if you're looking at six weeks chunks, at about week three, you have something that you can actually use. And then you're testing it and breaking it and fixing it and doing all that. And then you do a final approval process. And then on the sixth week, you're done. But at the same time, you've kind of overlapped a little bit and you've already started working on the next part of it. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very different approach from what I was classically trained in. Yeah, but I like it a lot better because we get results. So let me get to the, there's another, so uh, one more. Let me go to one more slide to show, kind of show sure. what we're looking at. Uh, actually, yeah. in our left handed thing. So, um, so the next steps in this project, as well as the pilot, is we're going to do a launch the new process statewide. So eventually, throughout the state, we do the same thing the same way which is a novel idea, I know. Uh, we're gonna, uh, after today, we're gonna update the subscriber requirements, and then these subscriber requirements will actually go to our other subscriber group and kind of fine tune it that way and see what they what they have to say. We'll add their requ additional requirements so we're looking at municipalities and, and other state agencies. Um, and Who's then, your other subscriber group? Uh, we have to go to the log buyers, uh, group, right, right. they get them, oh, they yes, subscribe, and then other state agencies. Uh, OSHA, OSHA, right. Department of Revenue, ODFW, and then there's several municipalities that use this. And uh, we may be, out of that process, we may separate those out as not good. You know, they've been, you know, they're just taking advantage of the user subscribers and system because it, it's a venue we're sending them information and that, you know, when we all paper, that was the only venue, so everybody signed up. And if this would be electronic, we may separate those out as 
not really subscribe, you know, public subscribers or really state agencies. And you know, if we get better, maybe they're just not in that transfer system. Okay. But right. exactly. we'll there's other solutions as we go. We may online. keep them yeah. in as subscribers. The, the fundamental question that I have is: Is this going to be available online to the public, and are people still going to have to pay for it? Paying for it? I can't answer that. Okay, That's a uh, question for them. Yes, it's going to be online and available to the public through a subscription. So once it becomes online, it's still we're still going to have to pay in order to get that information. Well, I don't have any. I you know the. If I don't, that, one of the reasons I've said is I'm hoping not. I'm hoping that cost of maintaining the subscriber system is reduced to the point that we don't need to charge. I have other stakeholders telling me that that's a bad idea. Um, the no, that's a bad idea. To not charge. Of course. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there so was no charge, can any member of the public decision. become a subscriber or not? That would be the ideal if there's really no cost to doing that. You know, the, in the back of my mind, I worry about things like what happens if our system gets hit by, you know, maybe there's not that much interest. What if it gets hit by too many, you know, what's the workload associated with that? How do we provide user support for subscribers? You know, the, the idea that you put this on an online system and nothing goes wrong, you know, who's, you know, when you're, when you get on and you can't get on to your account, who do you call? And so while you forget your password, who do you, who do you call? call? You need to change your password. So I, then I, we'll have to create an account in order to be able to access yeah. that. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's well, and so that we're, well, this is what we're kind of talking about, which right. you know, and um, I, I don't know the answer because we don't know how, and I don't know right now. We want to know what you want. But you know, is it, it does it become free at this point? I don't know what I'm building and what I'm supplying and what it's going to cost me. So I say I think it would be a good idea if it doesn't, if it's so easy to do that it doesn't do it. But if you know, on the other hand, if I say yeah, I got it online. Good luck, guys. Go use it. But you can't call me up when it doesn't work. Right. Is that going to be satisfactory to you? I so, think some of these questions will be answered once the vendor that yeah. that we choose actually starts to put the IT components and design it. And then we can see how user friendly is it, how low maintenance is it. Right. So, right. so when we say we don't have answers to questions, I think we all have ideas. Yeah, we love work people. Right, yes. no, push the understand. button, get what you want. Right. Right. But well, so then in a follow-up question, what kind of information are you going to want from us when we set up an account? It's simple. It just contact everybody. So let me get, let me get in here. And, and, and the reason one. we're having the login is twofold. One is, if you happen to be hacked, we know what account it is. We can we can maintain it, and fix it, right? And so there's some, an added level of security there. It's just not an open thing. But you can also set preferences to how you want to receive. So if there's a subscriber that doesn't have email and they want to receive everything hard copy, there will be those. Then the preference is everything's received hard copy, it automatically prints out and then we can mail it to them. Otherwise, if you want to receive it, a subscription on a weekly basis, a monthly summary, what does that look like? That's And that's what the login account allows you to have, is so that account of preference, say preferences. But we still have access like free access to the database, uh, or, or do you have to have that information sent to your account? Oh, you, oh, I see. You're not even talking about the subscription. You're talking about the thing that we do when you ask us for the monthly database. No, no, no. I'm no, talking about talking once about, get online. We're talking about we can go to the WRD site and find out water resources resource department. department site. Go to wrd.state.org.us, and we can. Double click on a map and find our house and see all the water rights in our area. We can find all the well logs for anywhere around us. We can zoom, actually go anywhere in the state and find well logs, certificates for water rights. Um, you need to look at that WRD site because it has exactly what we want. What we want is we want to double click on a map and see in, uh, sections highlighted. That are, that are where operations are occurring. 
Like a browsable map. Quarter quarter sections actually. Yeah. And uh, we, we click on that and, and it shows us a notification for that operation. And you need to be able to reference it by the by the road Because I was too. yeah. Because I was looking at it. Not just township rate. I was looking at it you're from looking, you're looking at it your first. subscription right. being I've predefined this area. No. And anything that occurs there uh -huh. is what you're notified on. But you're saying you want to be able to look I'm at. I'm talking it about holistic. Okay. There's really two different things. The subscriber yeah. thing still needs to happen. Mm -hmm. But there also should be open access for the general public to look at what's going on in their area as a whole, instead of a subscriber where it's pushed from your system. Here's a, here's a question. Talking about the user. Any, anybody should be able, just like on the WRD site, they should be able to look at their house and see what operations are going on in that. So it reminds me of like Google Earth. Yeah, exactly. 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 That's exactly. just yeah. right. Exactly. Have you ever been on the WRD site? Yes. It's so easy to use. One, one element of this discussion is that not all notifications that we receive occur. Sure. Right. Right. So that's well, no, that's, that's, that's I mean that that's something that yeah we're that, that's that's a one thing is not all notifications that we receive occur. So I you bet it's ninety percent. We don't. Uh, anyway, it's not. Yeah. We're down into the so, weather. It's going to be so more. Do Let's talk about what you want. Is I'm going to put. Uh, I'm not going to put this as a subscriber. Sorry. I'm going to mark this as kind of a, a statewide database, statewide browsing, or something. Statewide and we'll browsing. add another uh, another tab here. Yeah, because this is but not a subscriber system. Yeah. This is a public access system. Okay. So, all right. It's not a push system, it's a pull system. So if we have time, we'll get to that. I want to get through the subscriber part of it. Okay. And then otherwise, uh, give you my email address and okay, well, provide me your thoughts. I have an idea for a scenario for how this all works together that I'll, I can talk to you about. When I'm doing it. So to kind of go over, kind of review from the, we call it the landowner part of it. We've done the same thing from the, from the industrial and small business uh, landowners perspective of what they want. And they want to have the ability to have a secure login, predefine who their operators and landowners are. So they come in and they can very quickly just drop down menu, select who, who what all these categories are, pre-select exactly what they're doing, and then go to a, a, a map and draw on that map where they're going where their operation is going to be. It automatically at that point because of the database we have, this, this can link to all of our resources, identify any birds, fish, landslide concerns, other concerns that are on their resource, you know, protected resources. And then it'll notify them if there's a written plan wired or not. And if they have a written plan, they attach it. And so at that point, it comes into our system, they submit it, we ensure everything's there, they submit it, and then it comes into Partner Forestry for a review. And the review is either we we accept it or we reject it because there's there's something missing, maybe possibly from the written plan. But once it's once it is accepted, it's pulled into our system. And so that that where they've marked where their unit is is in our well GIS system. Then as a subscriber, there's a lay what's called a layer. GIS has several layers. Mm -hmm. The subscriber layer, if there's a subscriber in that area, you would then receive all the documentation. That's kind of an overall what's there. And if there's a written plan, you would receive a written plan. If there's a comment that you want to make, a comment would be put into the system so the search of forestry could review. That's what that whole login system is for in the subscription. So you so you can kind of manage it that way. Right. So the stewardship forester, the landowner and subscriber all have access to the same information at the same time. It's all live. There's no delay. And then you, you actually can go ahead and use that as a communication tool. So you back and forth with the state. That's kind of what we're envisioning. Mm -hmm. I, don't talk match, I don't know if that matches what you're looking at. So 